Um, I'm not Sophie, as you can tell, uh, but Sophie is stuck on a Eurostar, I guess. Um, so I'm volunteering to step in. So um, this is going to be a session where we talk about fundraising, and we have a couple of investors. Um, I'll kind of moderate, and I have the bad habit of answering my own questions, so it might happen again. Um, so we'll do a quick round of intro, um, and then we'll kick in with some question, and then leave it to the audience. Uh, and you can ask any nasty question, because actually that's how we, we kind of a roll. Um, I'm Ivan Farnetti. Um, I'm the co-founder of Five Season Ventures, uh, which is a VC fund based here in Paris. We invest throughout Europe, and we only invest in food for humans and for, uh, and for pets. Uh, early this morning when I arrived, I introduced myself to Hane, and I said, I'm even from uh, Five Season, and Hane went, oh, Five Season, which really made my day, uh, because we are only five years old as a fund, and five years ago, Five Season wasn't even a word. Um, we raised our fund in 2018, the first one, now we raised the second one, and we're raising more, and uh, for us, it's been an incredible journey to be probably one of the very first fund in Europe focused only on consumer food brands. Uh, there are lots of people that can do software, lots of them that are really, really good at. Uh, we're trying to carve out our name to be a good choice for entrepreneurs in Europe who want to have a specialist investor in uh, food brands. Thank you, Ivan. Um, I'm Peter from Good Generation Fund. We're an early stage fund in the food tech, green tech space. Uh, even younger than five season, have been established in 2021. Um, do invest early stages in yeah, technologies in the food and the space and beyond in the uh, associated consumer value chain within the pet food or particularly in the pet space. We have one company called VegDog, that's a plant-based dog food brand from Munich. Um, been around for a while, but one of the category leaders um, here in in Europe. Um, also some. More of our portfolio firms do cover the um, yeah the food or the particularly the pet food segment a bit broader um, when it comes to mycelium supply to um, other uh, pet food companies as well as um, packaging solutions for pet food firms. We're going from old to young here, uh, not per se in age I think, but uh, more in fund lifetime. Um, so my name is Jimmy. I'm one of the two partners actually at, uh, at V3 Ventures. Um, we were established in 2022 and um, we are the venture fund of Verlin Invest, um, the fund that Cecile, who just left, uh, works at. Um, so Verlin Invest, you know the background on 25 years old, um, uh, have been doing a lot of investments in the consumer space across health, beauty, <coughs> wellness, but also largely in pets. Um, my business partner and I focus on the earlier stages, so seed and series A, with tickets between one to five million. Um, similar focus in terms of sectors, um, and we always come, like to come in as a co-investor uh, or co-lead, um, so we tend to partner with all the lovely other funds that uh, play in this space. And I must say, Ivan, Five Seasons is a big uh, example for us, so uh, hopefully in a couple of years we can say the same. <laughs> Good. All right, so. <coughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on the questions that were supposed to be addressed to this panel, and I think some of them are quite generic and general, so I, I, I hope they're of everybody's interest. But one of the questions is, in the current environment, uh, with more macro uncertainty and a slower pace of VC activity, how is the overall investment approach changed, and how do pet tech and pet in general um, fe features in this context? Um, I'm supposed to ask the question, so I'm not going to answer it first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so, I mean, most of the funds are coming, or particularly venture capital funds, come from a very high, very overheated 2020, 2021 market, where they have paid in like crazy valuation for startups due to a very low interest environment. So the category itself has been very attractive um, for investors to step into the market until like, as probably many of you have noticed in your own fundraising efforts, markets have cooled down in the, in the past two years. So we do see that uh, fundraising cycles for startups take longer, up to two or three times, uh, yeah, two, two to three times more month until you have like, to conclude a fundraising round, um, as well as um, the overall round sizes have decreased um, significantly at all stages. Um, so we yeah, are putting a drought at the moment, which probably will go on for a couple more month for years. 
So yeah, I think it's the inevitable that it's slowed down a bit. Um, I think specifically for PET, obviously we've seen some remarkable transactions uh, over the past year. I let Ivan talk about Butternut Box, but Rover, um, obviously the acquisition uh, by Blackstone for two billion. We're seeing some remarkable outcomes in this space. So I think PET really shows to be resilient. We spoke about it this morning, um, and we continue to love it as a fund. I think more generically speaking, um, our fund has been founded in 2022, so it was post this crazy phase, so to say, uh, cost of capital is, what, is somewhat higher. Um, so I think what we're really looking for in the entrepreneurs is capital efficiency, right? So that we can see that they're just smart with the money that they have at hand. Um, and, and the value proposition obviously needs to make sense, right? So we don't invest pre-revenue. Um, we want to see that there's certain traction that we can track there. Um, and I suppose we can talk about that in the later questions as well. So, um, Having been around for now uh, more than two decades, um, this is not the first rodeo that I see. I mean, this uh, uh, last two years have been tough, but um, is the third time I see a crisis back from the dot-com burst and then the 2009. Um, and two things happen um, every time. Um, investors become more uh, reluctant to deploy capital because there is uncertainty. Whatever uncertainty you're talking about, it's like, oh, I don't know, I'm just gonna pass and wait another six months and see what happens. Um, and then the second thing that happens is, towards the end of the cycle, the companies that are the best in class will actually get incredible rounds or incredible valuations. Things that for everybody else are unconceivable. And the reason is quite simple. If you put yourself in our shoes for a second, um, for two years, a lot of the large investors are gonna be sitting doing nothing because we don't know what to do. Um, so when the best company of the bunch comes out, guess what? You're not gonna get fired, you're not gonna lose your job if you invest in the best company of the bunch. And even if you pay a bit more, it's a safer bet, right? So the pressure to deploy capital is gonna kick in in 2024 because nobody can stay for two years with doing nothing. Otherwise, our investor will say, hey, we pay you a management fee to sit and do nothing. That doesn't work. So I think 2024 is gonna be a really interesting year. And when you see the company like the Butterna Box coming out and people say, oh, but it was a high valuation. Yeah, but it was the best company of the bunch. Now the question is, is that um, a trigger to say, oh, we're over? No, it's not. Is when the other companies, the one you are now championing and raising for, when you have two or three of those picking up pace, I think we're getting out of this, um, this end pass. And, and I think the, um, the, the tricky bit here is to make sure that um, you arbitrage correctly between growth and profitability. I heard so many good stories today of companies that I knew were not pr um, profitable until six months ago. And everybody said like, yeah, but we tighten up the belt, we're weathering the storm. I think that it is a really, really good, um, really, really good strategy. Um, but 2024, will wish, is gonna, is gonna show the change of, of direction. So uh, switching to the next question, uh, there was a question about business models. In times like this, um, is there any particular business model that as investors, um, we tend to privilege, or some that all of a sudden becomes um, impossible to justify as a funding opportunity. So the, the pet category overall has very loyal customers because uh, a dog, a cat, or comparable animals, they do rarely change their behavior, their needs over the life cycle. They stay kids forever. So what baby food or baby products as a category are lacking, the long customer lifetime values is something that the products itself, they, they bring with them in the category. So um, but you look at pet food, um, um, medical services for, for animals, um, comparable business models, they all should drive in the current market environment as you spend once on a customer that you inquire and the customer life cycle, the customer lifetime value is hopefully um, very long and can pay off particularly highly even when thinking about current days more and more um, adults deciding for pets instead of kids. Um, to, to foster, so to say it's a trend that's, that can be observed across Western countries and even beyond. So I think we all agree that pet food obviously uh, is, is getting quite crowded and we've seen a lot of fantastic pitches today and I think there's still a lot of improvement and, and, and room and opportunity in that space. Um, we as a fund see multiple different models from veterinary change to food to insurance um, and I think one thing that we'd love to see 
more, and there luckily are some companies that are really popping up in that space, is the cross-pollination of different um, uh, services, essentially, in the value chain, right? So take, for example, insurance um, and diagnostics or health tracking. And I think there's a lot of um, uh, utility in the data that we can gather from our pet, um, which is going to be hugely valuable for the, for the future um, and will benefit everyone in that ecosystem. So. I guess that the data play is something we would love to see in a consumerized way. Um, and I think the likes of Lassie obviously just rained, raised a massive round with Balderton. Um, Napo is doing fantastic things in the insurance space. Um, so I think the cross-pollination there in, in services and data, I think, is something that we would love to see more and more in the future. Um, so at Five Seasons, we would love to do the whole fund in pet food. All of it, 200 million, boom, all of it. It's impossible because all, all of a sudden you start to invest in competing businesses. But we love pet food for a number of reasons. Um, they were right in the uh, before crisis and they're even more right after now. The interesting thing is that we went back looking at the stats of elasticity to price in 2001 and 2009 and today. And guess what? Uh, pet food is the only category that is able to transfer entirely the cost increase in your supply chain of your raw material onto consumers, and consumers don't move. No other category is able to do that. It's almost like magic. There is almost no price elasticity in this category. OK, there are limits, probably. If you, if you double the prices, it's going to move. But you know, 20, 25% price increases, no movement. Imagine that. So if you're thinking, oh, we're sitting in an uncomfortable chair, every other founder of companies in every other sector is sitting in a much, much worse position. So I think for us, we only invest in food. We don't invest in some of the other things, and maybe in the future we will, but at the moment we can't do that. But I think you know, the, the, the spending per pet has increased. Now you have additional services, so additional products, additional uh, benefits. And I think the other thing that people talk about is subscription. Guess what? In the human food market, subscri subscri subscription does not work, right? We don't. We don't think that way for food. But for pets, it's amazing. And if you can have like a 70% retention at the end of the first year, 50% at the end of the second year, the only thing you need to do is to add one more thing in the box. So for us, um, for pet food, subscription-based model where you can put one more thing in the box because you have a billing relationship with a with a pet owner. Those are the number one for for that, and we don't know enough about the other stuff to comment on. Um, but you know, I I can see what you guys are talking about in terms of additional services being really, really, really exciting. Um, given the interest of time, I think our questions. I think well, I will cut them off and management decision. I would love to have more questions from the audience because at the end of the day. Uh, you know, we're here for, for, for the entrepreneurs in the, in the room. So um, anyone wants to fire the first question? Go ahead. Uh, you want the biscuit. You always ask the same, the first question three times over. No, no, but she wins. She, she's won. She's, she's the first one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, as investors, um, if you're looking at food and tech, um, <coughs> specifically in pets, um, what is it that you're, what sort of metrics do you look for when you're deciding whether to invest? Is it more soft metrics in terms of, oh, you know, we've got customer retention, or is it more growth metrics? We're getting as much market market. What is it you look for in a company? And, um, how, how does that differentiate between the vertical So that was our next question, actually, <laughs> in the form. Um, so it sounds very, very, very easy, and we spoke about it this morning as well, but margins are, are key, right? So just to, stop from, to start from the top, uh, your gross margins need, need to be uh, in a good place. Um, I think for food margins, they, relatively speaking, are tough, especially if we compare them to beauty margins, which we invest in as well. Um, I think, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, but, but between sort of like 
around 50 percent uh, uh, starting gross margin is something that we would see as something that's that's strong. Um, obviously, you have to look at your CM2 margin, which is post delivery, because food is not the easiest to ship, right? So that's something that we heavily focus on: is how does the model develop over time, um, when scale kicks in, and uh, and how are the margins at start? Um, then we look at the lifetime, right? So what do we see in terms of repeat? Um, and and I think the repeat nature of the business obviously is quite hard to get from the start, right? So are there aren't any other signals or signs that we can focus on in terms of customer love, in terms of reviews, in terms of MPS, referral rates, etc. So that's something that we're really looking for at the start is, is there actual love for this value proposition and how do we extrapolate that into retention? If the business is a bit later stage, obviously you can look at the retention rates. Um, and I think Ivan just mentioned some rates that would be fantastic. Um, I guess those are, those are stellar. Um, and lastly, for me at least, is the efficiency of the acquisition here. Um, because I often say CACs don't really matter how high they are if your retention is massive, right? Um, however, in this market, you do need to justify your CACs a bit more. I would say anything lower than six months payback period of your CAC would be decent to good, um, especially in the early stages of the company. Those are all hard metrics. I'll leave it maybe up to you to say something else on that. Yeah, so as the category itself is maturing a bit further, there are also like potentials now to bring in like ingredient innovation or other like more soft aspects that cannot be always checked <laughs> on hard, hard KPIs. This is something that's a little bit more up to guess by the investor or up to like a bottom up or top down model where you um, define what the long term um, effect of, of such a measurement will be. Um, but I agree to you first and foremost, it's about um, those like revenue or profitability related KPIs. I'll just mention two more. I, I agree fully. We all you know, look at the same thing, probably the same, same way. Um, Oftentimes, if you are like a single product company, your single product has to be amazing. Um, we see a lot of companies and we heard some pitches of people, oh, but we need to add this other thing and another thing and another thing. Um, there is a limit to that being uh, a good idea and becoming a justification for your hero product not to be good enough. If your hero product at the beginning is strong, 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 that product should lift a lot of the burden of the company. And then you add additional stuff. If you're not confident about your hero product, it's like 10% of revenues, then you start to branching out too early. That's probably a negative sign. Um, the other thing that um, the, the friends at, at, uh, at Purina have um, shared with us a lot, and we really believe it, is um, it's a qualitative metrics. And it's about understanding how important for the long term of the, of, of the company future is the real impact on resources. Scope three emissions are a real issue, not now, but in three years from now. But you, unless you do something about your supply chain today, in three years from now, it's gonna to be too late. And if one day you're sitting in front of <clears throat> somebody here in the room, uh, negotiating your exit, um, or somebody else, um, there might be a chance that you have to justify why the buyer needs to spend 20 million to fix the supply chain. And that 20, 20 million, if you haven't done the homework today, um, will come off the price in three years from now. So we spend a lot of time looking at the supply chain and how it's thought through in terms of scope three emission early on. There was another question in the front. I think it's important um, what you can bring on to verify your hypothesis in the company. Like, do you have comparable data from I know, more mature companies in other geographies, for example, or um, other business models that can relate to what you're doing? So it's, it's a, probably it's a more an angel investment business than it's people who believe in you as a founder and who can make it work. Yeah, and I, and I think beyond that, um, it's also free to do surveys, right? And, and to do customer research and really delve into 
how people buy and what the journey is. And, and again, this was, this was mentioned this morning, but I think often the founders that we speak to at seed stage don't yet have the full answer that you could have you know, by actually surveying all your clients, or not all your clients, but you know, doing a proxy of, of, of your value proposition. So I think that's really the easiest way to shape both your product portfolio and your brand mission and, 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 um, and, and yeah, strategy. So it's I think it was Dave McClure a few years ago uh, in one of the speeches in California, we said like, if you're a pre-revenue pre founder, you have to lead with your best foot forward. So if you have a founder who's a rock star because he's done like five uh, companies before, just focus on that one. If you have some early metrics, even as little as they are, if numbers is your friend, lead with that one. If you have an unfair competitive advantage because of something, just lead with that one. But I'm not an expert on the area, so I'm just gonna quote somebody else's. If it's wrong, it's his fault, not mine. Um, <laughs> another question. Uh, You guys have talked a lot about pet food and pets, um, but there is different kind of uh, industry that could be invested in, in 2024 in, in the pet industry. For example, I would say life science. Uh, we've seen a lot of things uh, regarding cooperative models uh, using companion animals and translating it to the human health. Uh, is that um, an industry or something that you're interested in, or do you see some, some value? So for, for our fund, we're heavily focused on investing in, in the consumer brands or pet brands, right? Um, and I think the majority of the models that you refer to right now are more B2B or B2B2C. Um, so personally, we don't tend to focus too much on it. I do think there's a massive opportunity, opportunity in this uh, bioscience, uh, microbiome hacking, personalizing the pet food based on actual results. Um, my big question there is how do you differentiate as a research company if you don't have the full IP there, right? So there are, sometimes it could be commoditized as well, this data. So the question is, where is your defensibility as a company in that space? But again, I'm really not an expert on, on that because we only do brands. Same here. <laughs> Go ahead. Obviously, investors like to talk about success stories. It'd be really helpful, without going into specifics, if you might share any <coughs> high or low profile failures that shape your attitudes as investors, with, especially with young companies, just so we can have an insight into what's steering you to make decisions. Please, if you're happy, if you're happy sharing that. <coughs> Um, so there, there are lots, right? <laughs> uh, we all make mistakes, and um, I think it's more how you respond to those mistakes and uh, and, and optimize for those in the future. Um, I think the majority of the ones that pop to mind for me um, are more in sort of the production phase of the company and the supply chain, and because often you start a company because you love the problem that you're solving on the commercial side, but that doesn't mean that you're the best person to optimize and design the supply chain, right? So I think, uh, especially in food, right, you just have to be super careful because it's something that people digest and it's nutrition. So, um, but an, another one which is not super relevant for this crowd, but it was also a production issue is a e-bike company, um, right? And I think if you, if you get to the source of the problem, fast enough and you are able to be honest to the entrepreneurs and they are honest to the investor and I think that's really important to have that relationship then I think you can turn around things quite fast and easy but it will be uncomfortable and you have to be super candid in, in that regard. So success and failure also very much depends on like what the fund investment strategy is. Some <coughs> funds go for um, the return on a single investment in terms of money multiple of 5 to 10x ideally other ones go for full fund returners. So while your exit for the firm might be a success for some case, for another venture capitalist, for example, it might be not a good one. So it's very important to really discuss the um, expectation with the VC that he's putting into you. And then you can hopefully or ideally avoid having a discussion if you're like a, a failure or a success. I, I fully agree. I think this is a really good, um, good answer. Um, there, there, there is a concept of broader market fit and you know, all this stuff, but there is actually a, a concept of um, 
product investor fit or company investor fit. Um, if, you, um, if you raise money from a fund that is like a billion, right, then that fund will put pressure on you to become a 10 billion invest, uh, investment return. And some companies don't deserve that pressure, don't need that pressure, right? On the other side, if you take money from an angel investor, that is probably going to have absolutely no pressure on you. But the question is, but if we need more money, do you have more money? So those two questions, can you follow your money? Or what do you expect from us? Um, I honestly think that um, some of the things that didn't work in our portfolio is when those two questions had not been asked at the right time. Mm. Um, and sometimes we made the mistake because we brought in a co-investor that was like a phenomenal large fund. And all of a sudden, the game plan had to change. And we kind of didn't realize that. But all of a sudden, you have to make different decisions. The, cost, the, the capital requirement goes up a lot. And you were not even prepared to do that. And you didn't know it. So not asking those alignment questions probably is the one company killer when the company is actually good. right? You can still kill it because of that. You mentioned that there was these one or two big deals that kind of have, have at least started to thaw the environment. Then you mentioned that there's going to be, that what you're actually waiting for is for the next two or three smaller deals that uh, will, will actually say that, that the environment has started again. What do you think is going to cause those next two to three or you know five or six smaller deals that will you know kind of reset the environment? Is more on the funding side, I suppose. <coughs> Um, I, I, I think pressure to invest is not to be underestimated. Um, again, with my crystal ball, which is really functioning, bought it on eBay, um, I would say what's going to happen in 2024, there will be probably two or three larger deals. Larger, don't dream about hundreds of millions, but maybe tens of millions, 20, 30 million rounds, where I suspect uh, the likes of us, some of our colleagues here and the three, four other large consumer funds will take a big breath, say, OK, it's 30 million. Let's do 10 each, share the risk, and go in maybe at the valuation that is a very <coughs> rational valuation. So sharing of risk and adjustment of valuation will probably create that one, two, three um, um, transaction that will hopefully <coughs> defrost the atmosphere, yeah. I hope. You guys think? Yes, I also believe that, um, and again, we're kind of looking a little bit more at the, at the food space right now, but I think there will be more consolidation as well, given that you have, you know, you have dog, you have cat, you have US, you have Europe, you have different markets. And I think in order to, um, you know, fulfill those synergies between all markets and strategies, I, I personally think there will be more consolidation in, in that market as well. Um, no, nothing to add here. Right. Next question. We have, we have room for another two questions, I guess. Uh, how transparent are the borders in Europe? And does it make it easier to find funding if you're in multiple countries or just focusing on your own country? <laughs> uh, thank you, Nick, for the. <laughs> no. I mean, this depends on like how, how niche or how, how mainstream you are of the business model that you're following. But usually, I mean, I would say that most of the companies following in kind of an e-commerce <coughs> approach, um, does you have like a tailored website, tailored um, uh, yeah, keywording, um, something similar, you have like still some kind of national boundaries when it comes to logistics. So I would say that at least early stages, focusing on one market and like placing this market really full or like getting a high penetration makes it easier to raise funds and to scale in the beginning. I, I, I thank you for the, the extra second to think about the answer. Um, I think it depends also on the product. Uh, so if you're doing sausages, right? We all eat sausages. We all love, love sausages. But sausages taste different in every country. Uh, we all like chicken nuggets. But guess what? Chicken nuggets are bought and consumed differently in Germany, because they like it to, to have chilled in the pan, and in the UK, because they like it to have frozen in the oven, right? So brands are built differently in different countries for human food. For pet food, probably I would tone that down a little bit, like in snacking. You know, they are fairly generic. 
So I think in pet food, the cross investments between a, a German fund into a French company or a French fund into a UK company, I think if you have decent metrics, I, I don't think the geography in itself is an issue. Uh, probably more through a later stage than early stage. You know, Jam Jar, for instance, they do amazing in in UK. There is no deal that go get done without them knowing. Um, but I think I I don't think necessarily is a limitation. So we've done recently an investment, uh, another round of investment in Mamali in Germany. It's a German company. Ninety percent of the revenues are in Germany. We were originally a French-ish investor that invested last time, and now it's a Spanish investment fund, Spanish UK, they got in. So I think the evidence would say that for high quality company with good growth, uh, cross, in, cross international investments, not a big issue. I agree, and I think if you as a founder and entrepreneur choose to work uh, with an investor, you have to be smart, right? So it's not just money, and, and you need to see what the value add is going to be. Um, and that could, for example, be that there's a very local network in retail, or um, you know, there's other synergies to be made with the company. So I think I don't think there's too much. Uh, I think there's a lot of overlap, sorry, in terms of like markets. Um, and I think you as the founder just have to see with whom you like to work and what your strategy for the company is going forward, because it can really help to have a local investor. One final <coughs> question. In the back. Back. Hi, um, you mentioned more companies are focusing on their gross margins and having shorter CAC payback periods. Do you think that's going to push more companies to look for debt rather than equity? And what percentage of your deals is there also a debt element coming from someone else? Um, Debt is quite difficult these days, uh, given the rates. Um, we have some of our companies, so for example, Catkin, which is uh, one of the biggest UK fresh cat food brands, um, that does have some debt, um, but that came after the deal, essentially. So we do full equity uh, transition, uh, transactions, and um, I think in terms of, you know, if, you, if you're able to attract debt, for, for example, for your CapEx investments into factories, et cetera, I think it's, uh, could be super beneficial and useful, um, but at the right rates, right? So one very overlooked kind of debt is actually crowdfunding in the space, hmm? and particularly the, the pet industry itself. It, it, it's more suitable than any kind of other segment for this because most of like retail-oriented investors do understand this. So it's a tangible product, a tangible service that people see and understand. Doesn't always make sense, particularly if you go for a big game, want to go like a unicorn, that kind of uh, crowdfunding affected cap table or capital a lot of debt in the beginning might uh, distract investors from your firm. But um, overall, um, if you're like in the beginning in these days where money is more scarce, it, it might make sense to go for that particular source of debt and present your kind of product towards, towards the crowd. Kim, how are we doing with time? Shall we keep, keep going? Yeah. Um, last year you mentioned once, uh, if you find an investor, take the money and run. Yeah. So, sorry, can, can you repeat last, the question? Last year somewhere on a fair you mentioned once, or one of you mentioned, uh, if you find found an investor, take the money and run. Yeah. Take the money, take the deal. Would that still be your advice today, or would you say no? Let, 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 me, let me paraphrase what you said. So. If you are an entrepreneur and you have an offer from an investor, take the money and focus on closing the deal. Absolutely, I would say exactly the same thing today. Um, you know, if you do have a bona fide investor who's done due diligence, you've done your due diligence on them, mm -hmm. making sure the alignment is, is spot on. Um, don't be cute for 5% more. Try to go and waste the time and run in the risk that something happens in the portfolio or something happens <coughs> and all of a sudden that offer disappears. Um, I think closing, closing offers right now, it's a good KPI for all of you. If you do have one, it's enough. Just optimize that one and bring it, bring it home. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Maybe just lastly to add to that there, we also see sometimes, and it's much less right now, but entrepreneurs who still think, even though they do you know, sub one million in revenue that they can raise it, 15 or 20 million rounds, and they go to market, and 
you know, that's a really big risk because the, the quality investors that might want to invest in your company will neglect it straight away, right? So just try to be realistic. And we look for entrepreneurs who are, you know, outliers in their thinking, right? But you have to do it within a certain bandwidth because otherwise there's just a risk of losing uh, quality investors on your deal. One more. One more question. One more. <laughs> if not. Maybe just one last bit of advice, I think, maybe from the three of us. Um, so given that we are very heavily focused on brand, um, for me, I can't stress enough to really focus on you know, your mission as a brand. Really try to stand for something. And I think in the beginning stages of a company, you try to do a lot of things at the same time. But try to stand for something, I think, if you piss other brands off or piss other people off, it's fine. But that means that you stand for something, right? So I think that's really important because it's super crowded out there. CACs are rising. Um, and if you are very authentic with your brand and your product, try to stick to that. And uh, if the product is good enough, you get through it. Yeah, I add to that that it's, even though it's tougher at the moment to fundraise, it's still a numbers game. So you don't have made, made to approach a hundred like investors, about thousand investors to get around like kind of close. But end of the day, right now there's so much um, dry money within investment funds um, as never been before. And then at some point in time, the market has to turn around again. And then if you are the persistent one who have been keeping fundraising, keeping on with the business, you might be actually the one who's benefiting from these um, amounts of money left to be allocated to firms in the space. Um, raising money is always difficult. Right now it's more difficult which means that if you do it on a Friday afternoon from seven o'clock onward, you're probably gonna do a shit job. So if you are thinking or you think in 2024, you're gonna raise money, do two things. One, put in your diary half a day of clear time, maybe in the morning, not in the evening. Think with your best brain in and find somebody else in the company, who's not you, who's gonna pick up the slack of that extra day. That extra day will become weeks when you're actually talking to investors. We are notoriously slow, we don't respond, blah, blah, blah. It's frustrating. So if you spend all of your time chasing the investors, you do need somebody in the firm who stays in and back you up. But don't do it on a Friday afternoon. Don't leave that thinking later on because it is really difficult and you want to give yourself the best chances. So put, put time in your own diary and, and stick to it. All right. Yeah.